Oh, we doubt tonight, though, over at Simmons Bank Liberty Stadium. Those Memphis Tigers looking for a big-time bounce back because we can, we can play the video, unfortunately. But uh, last Saturday, just really, really tough situation in a game. We knew they had to have every game in conference play from here on out, but they go to UTSA. They're off 24-14. Dear Black of T gets hurt celebrating a touchdown, trying to do some sort of Cristiano Ronaldo touchdown, and then it all falls apart for the Tigers. Roadrunner score. 27 unanswered points at one at one juncture. Tigers make a little comeback late. Uh, couldn't complete it, though, as they lost 44-36. And with it, their conference championship hopes are all but over, bar a miracle. Their college football playoff hopes are gone. Uh, we knew that minimal, they could only lose one game uh, and win the conference championship for that to be reality. So that's gone now. They host a Rice team tonight that, Man, what makes the Tigers losing last week even more painful is that Rice knocked off Navy, one of those teams ahead of the Tigers, in conference play and in the college football playoff pecking order going to last week. So, uh, you know, you can't take Rice lightly. I know Rice is not exactly the most prestigious athletic school in this conference, uh, but, you know, they beat a really good team last week, and Navy held them to 10 points. So maybe that says a little something about Navy, but... Uh, the midshipmen have played good ball all year, so the Tigers are seven-point favorites tonight. I, I expect them. I, I do think the character of the team and some of the leadership, I, I don't think they're going to lay over. Uh, I think they're going to come out with a point to prove tonight. I also know that last year when they ended up winning 10 games after the bowl win, you know, it might be – it might seem insignificant, but I know that the 10-win mark did mean something to those guys. So that is still on the table. I think they could win – 11 games if they went out in the regular season and win the bowl game. But, yeah, it's, it's just tough to think that, um, you know, this season that had all this hype and the expectations going into it, you look at it and before Election Day, that was all out the window. Uh, so it's kind of tough. Yeah, it's kind of a culmination of all the things that we've been talking about all year, all these close games. I kind of feel like they've got to put this all together, and it finally came back to bite them this week. Um, but yeah, I mean, Rice. You look at their record, only three and six. But again, it's they defeated Navy, who you beat know, Memphis. Who, who's who beat Memphis and has really looked really good all year. Yeah. So I think the it's not gonna be easy. You know, it's like we've talked about. You know, the message coming out of the program, and I get it, is they'll take the close wins, and at the end of the day, the victory is all that matters. But this is where. The process of how you get there and the eye tests and kind of some of the underlying stuff, it does matter because eventually when you let, call it what it is, lesser teams, certainly on talent, hang around week after week, eventually it bites you. And it bit them last week. And UTSA, I'm not saying that it's a, a team that doesn't have any talented players, but clearly I think you look at the two teams on paper, Memphis roster is a lot more talented. And now, again, the game changed when Demir Blackamse hurt his knee on the touchdown celebration, which is going to go down as another low-key, just kind of infamous, silly Memphis sports moment, uh, especially because he was having a huge game. I mean, at that point, early second quarter, I think he had six catches, 140 yards, two touchdowns. And with the way that he threatens a defense with his speed and the way he could take the top off on any given play, I think it's early change the game. But, again, I, you know, I don't think that the offense – should completely fall apart just based off that because they got nothing going for like seven drives after that until the end of the game when they were down three possessions and UTSA is playing, you know, soft coverages and kind of giving them some underneath stuff. And, <coughs> excuse me, I think the kind of the, the most bitter pill to swallow and the toughest reality of the situation is, if not this year, when? Right. Because any way you slice it, Unless you hit on a miracle in the portal, not out of the question with the FedEx money, with the NIL money they now have, or if Aaron Tomaden, who's a freshman right now, or Antoine Hill, their four-star commit from uh, the Warner Robins, Georgia area, who's going to come in next year. Unless one of them pulls essentially a Seth Hennigan and just walks into the starting job and is just ready to play and have them be competitive right away, you're almost certainly downgrading a quarterback next year, and probably relatively significantly. I know 
you know, Seth is not immune from criticism either. I don't think he's played his best ball this year. You know, I look back to like the last seven games of last season. I think that's the best quarterbacking I've seen him play since I've been covering the team at least. At least I've covered him since his sophomore year. So that hasn't really carried over this year. Uh, but still, you know, you go to either, you know, essentially a retro freshman or a true freshman, or you gamble in the portal that you land someone if you bring back a bunch of these guys that still have eligibility rating. But other than that, I just, you know, it, everything was set up for this year. You brought back the four-year starting quarterback, same head coach, same offense coordinator, defense coordinator that put on a great performance in the bowl game win last year. Great trio of receivers at the top. Rock Taylor, Demir Blankensee, Kobe Drake. You lose Blake Watson, who was your best offensive player last year. But you bring in Mario Anderson, leading rusher at an SEC school last season. He's been probably better than expected. Um, and there were high hopes for him. But Mario's been awesome. Bring back a lot of talent on the defense side of the ball. And you look at it, and it just it's not going to happen. And it's just a tough pill to swallow because you look at it and say – when will it happen? When can it happen again? So, and you know, moving forward, the twelve-team playoff does give you more hope than you would have previously. But there is something to that striking while you can, because yeah. you never know what next year is going to bring. And you look no further than Florida State and what's happened to them this, this year. Last year, you know, everyone felt like they were snubbed out of the playoff spot. Um, undefeated season and they come out this year with a lot of the same team same head coach and they just look horrible yeah so you know when you've got the talent you really can't just sit around and go well we'll get them next year it's you've got to strike a while <coughs> pretty significant downgrade Jordan Travis to DJU but but Florida State's problems sure. do go well beyond the quarterback situation uh, I also think that we we might have to face the reality that you know, the Tigers this year might have been a touch overrated off winning the bowl game over Iowa State at the end of last season. Because remember before that, you know, they had won nine games in the regular season, but the tenor around the program going into the bowl game wasn't all that great. But then they win the bowl game, and then you think, and it comes to fruition, you're bringing back all these guys, they've got a you know, good NIL uh, chamber to kind of pull money from. You're like, okay, maybe this is it. And even the Florida State loss, or win, excuse me, how good of a win is that now? Because they it's stink. Not, it's really not. They stink. I don't care what that program's done in the past. I don't care what conference they play in. They I don't care about seven now. Florida I think State, so. I think. And, 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 and they've gotten run off the field a bunch of times. I yeah. mean, they are real. I mean, we're talking one of the worst teams in the Power Four conferences. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I I I haven't looked up and down those standings, uh, but. I know Purdue, I think, is like one and seven also. Um, Let's give a quick yeah. let. Okay. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> Cal, is, Cal is. But even Cal. Cal, so Cal Florida beat State, Auburn, right? Yeah, Cal's four and four. I mean, they're always. Auburn's four. not great, but. Like, you're talking Stanford, Cal. Uh, even I think Oklahoma State's probably better than. Um, yeah, I mean, this is one of the – yeah, Purdue is probably up there. Purdue is also 1-7. And, and I can't imagine there's anyone in the SEC that's worse than Florida State. I know there's a there's a certain team in the SEC I, that's I, got but, two wins. You know, Mississippi State, <laughs> but, again, they're playing – now they're playing a true freshman quarterback, and they've got yeah. a first-year head coach. So, no, I mean, <clears throat> you're looking at FSU being probably one of the two or three worst teams in Power Four conferences. So, yeah, the win doesn't look that great. Okay, let's talk about – uh, so, first and foremost, Memphis versus Rice tonight, uh, 8 p.m. kick at Simmons Bank Liberty Stadium, which is a, a little silly. Um, it seems late. I kind of I hope people show up with all the high school football tonight. I'm curious what the crowd looks like, but we'll see. And hopefully, Not the Tigers, perfect weather either. Yeah. But. Hopefully, the Tigers get back on track and score win number eight tonight. All right. The biggest game of the weekend around here, biggest game in the Mid-South this season, going down in Oxford tomorrow. Ole Miss playing host to Georgia. This game is going to make or break the Rebel season. Uh, probably without question the biggest game of Lane Kiffin's tenure. Now, Ole Miss is coming in off a high, off beating Arkansas a couple weeks ago in a game. Dominating. Yeah, I mean, just Dominating. destroyed that. If you want to roll that video real quick. Uh, yes. Jackson Dart and Jordan Watkins just putting up video game numbers in that game. Dart breaks Archie Mennings. 
record for total offense in a game by an Ole Miss player, and a big part of it was Jordan Watkins. Eight catches, 254 yards. That's a program record. Five touchdown catches, also a program record. In a game where the Rebels did not have Trey Harris, their number one receiver, but uh, Jordan Watkins just tore this Razorback secondary to shreds. If you, if you have – if you play college football, fantasy football, and had Jordan Watkins on your team, you had a really, really good week. Um, so, yeah, a good couple of games for them, really, because uh, the week before they beat Oklahoma at home. wasn't a dominant performance, but they played well in the second half. Absolutely throttled the Razorbacks, their best performance of the season. So now they're riding a high going into this game tomorrow against the number three team in the country in Georgia. Weather is supposed to be really bad down there from everything that we've heard from our trusted meteorologist here at Action News 5. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, this is a game that is going to define their season. And right or wrong, I think the narrative around Lane Kiffin for a lot of his tenure and his career, and certainly here at Ole Miss, is that he has struggled to win the most important and the biggest games. Yeah. So can he upend that tomorrow? I, I think Georgia is really good, but I think that if you are going to face Georgia the last couple of years, this is the Georgia team you want to face because I'm not – I'm not a big Carson Beck believer. I think it's pretty reasonable to say Ole Miss has the best quarterback in this game. Um, I, I, yeah, I would say so. Um, yeah, they really did exactly what they needed last week. They needed something to feel good about. They needed to basically show no mercy to Arkansas. Yeah. Um, you know, I saw a lot of people chatting about Lane Kiffin running the score up, but, I mean. Who cares? You, you, get, you had to do that because yeah. you have to get the guys rolling. <laughs> heading into Georgia because we saw early in the year they lost to a Kentucky team that's not on their level. Yeah. And, and, and they, you, have to, you have to bring your absolute best against Georgia because even in Georgia's one loss to Alabama this year, they looked incredible in the second half. Yeah. So they haven't really played a poor game all year. And you really have to play your absolute best well, against Georgia. Well, and to anyone complain about them running up the score, we don't know how – the selection committee is going to approach this new format, but I imagine yeah. point differential is something they're going to look at. So running, so running that point differential up is probably relatively important. Uh, Bulldogs beat uh, Florida last week in their annual rivalry game. That was an interesting game. Georgia got pulled away at the end to win at 34-20, but UF with their third-string quarterback, because it's DJ Lagway, their starter, got hurt early in the game, they were around a pretty good amount. Um, I do think that Georgia probably has the best win of the college football season going into Austin and uh, beating yeah. the Longhorns. So I agree to that. Uh, they've won four in a row. But again, this hasn't so far, this hasn't looked like some of the ultra dominant Georgia teams that we saw when they won back to back national championships, even last year. I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to say they were the best team last year. But I think if they would have gotten the playoff, they literally lost the one game they could not lose to Alabama in the SEC exactly, championship yeah. game. I think if they would have gotten the playoff, there's a pretty good chance they would have won it all. I think they could have beaten any of the yeah. any of the teams that, uh, that made it above. Yeah, them. they they lost the one game they could not lose last year. But yeah, I, I think that you know you're at home, you're at Vaught Hemingway. That place is going to be rocking tomorrow. Hopefully, Trey Harris plays. Did you see uh, their their injury report? I have Lane Kiffin is trolling the hell out of the SEC. There's like oh 29 players on the injury report. And some of them are listed as doubtful, which, I mean, if I'm wrong, I'll eat my words. Like Jordan Watkins, for example, left that game, or um, who had that monster game last week, and had no ill effects. Apparently he's doubtful on the injury report. So mm. I guess we'll find out if this is Lane well, being a troll or not. Yeah, it, it, if it's legit, that's – Oh, that's it's a, a because big, Trey Harris is also doubtful. Big, oh, Trey, um, Harris, and Trey Harris might be in danger of missing the game. This yeah. is – I'm glad that we have injury reports because with all the money in college athletics on multiple fronts, it makes too much sense, and it's only in the SEC, I believe. But <coughs> the NFL, you get injury reports every day of practice throughout the week, Wednesday, yeah. Thursday, Friday. It would be nice if you get that in the SEC versus – you just get one on a Wednesday – so I'm sure all of these guys, or not all of these guys, but a lot of these guys are magically going to get better by, by the time kickoff rolls around tomorrow at 2.30. Uh, Griffin Deboray will be at that game. Ole Miss's finest alum here at Action News 5. <laughs> I think one of the only Ole Miss alum. We've got way, way more Mississippi State Bulldogs in this building. Speaking of them, 
Another all Mid South matchup. They go to Knoxville, Martin and Neal to take on Tennessee. Uh, general thoughts as a Bulldog alum. Uh, scared. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing to be scared of. You know, I, I said last <coughs> week how bad UMass is as a program. Yeah. They, I mean, that game didn't end up being close, but they didn't necessarily dominate that game. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't really know that there's a lot that you can take out of that win. Um, it did end the losing streak, which uh, feels a little good, but yeah. I what mean, an end to the season. I don't think they have any realistic chance at Tennessee on the road. Um, ten, yeah. Yeah. Uh, their the last... defense is still a big mess, and yeah. they, they didn't really do a great job of stopping UMass, who I don't imagine has a powerhouse offense. Um, so I, I imagine Tennessee is probably going to put up a lot of points tomorrow. Um, and as we've seen all year, the Mississippi State offense is better. They look pretty solid with Van Buren at quarterback, but <laughs> they're going to have to put up like 50-plus points to have a shot tomorrow. You know what's interesting about Tennessee, though? They started the season, they scored 69 on Chattanooga, they scored 51 on NC State, 71 on Kent State, but since then they have not scored more than 28 points, which was against Kentucky last week. So, yeah. you know, we've, we've seen that offense kind of come back to earth a little bit. Nico hasn't played as well. Really, Dylan Sampson has been the one uh, that's been the engine of that offense. But, yeah, you look over – I remember I looked over at the Mississippi State UMass score early last week, and I'm like, yeah, what's going on here? And it didn't end up being that close. It was but. a little ugly at, in the first quarter. First half, I guess, but. All right, that uh, is a 6 p.m. kick from Knoxville tomorrow, and then Arkansas is on a bye. Much needed bye. <laughs> yeah, after last week, for sure. All right, let's talk basketball, and I'm going to switch the order here. We're going to talk okay. Grizzlies first, because the other night, uh, the game and uh, the matchup that kind of dominated the NBA world for the last 24 hours on social media channels and talk and whatnot Grizzlies beat the Lakers 131-114. That is not what got people talking. Please roll this video, if you will, because the two headliners, Ja Morant and LeBron James, went at it. All right, starts here. This is the second quarter. Ja and one bucket on Gabe Vincent tells him we're too small afterwards. Okay? Next possession down. LeBron gets matched up with Ja, and obviously Ja is too small for LeBron. Probably a charge there. Nothing close to it. LeBron says, we're too small. So now I believe this was the possession after that. LeBron to the cup, tough finish, steps over Brandon Clark. The shot, gets the ball, races up the floor. He's going at Gabe Vincent again, who likes that matchup. Tough backer off glass, and then runs over to LeBron, saves the second. And he got called for a technical foul for that. And really fast forward came along. Uh, it was an awesome moment, to be honest. And it kind of fits into the real duck the smoke there. Now, Ja had a lot to say about that moment and about the Lakers in general, if we will roll that uh, video, because it was I mean, gold. I think I did it too small to somebody who was too small. I mean, he came back and did it respectfully. You know, he's six eight, whatever. I would I would expect it. I thought it was a charge. Uh, he did it, and I don't back down from nobody. Don't care who you are. Um, my, my job was to just come back. I got my bucket, and, you know, I set the tone. My teammates fed off of it, and you see what happened. So, um, top dog in our league, you take out the top dog, you know, who else you, you fear? You get up, man. I don't fear nobody anyway, but, yeah. I ain't, I ain't had to, you know, I ain't had to get up. I ain't, I ain't been down. John, what was it like to, I mean, obviously when you went out of the game, it was frustrating, but to see the team take that lead even. I wasn't surprised when I went out. I just wanted to be on the floor. I knew we was winning the game. What is it about this Laker team? It always I don't like them. They knocked me out the playoffs. And then last last year we you know had a game and they came in here and popped it on our home floor when I was in street clothes. So I wasn't the night. I told them that last time too. Has did I been building since you told LeBron last time? Wait till I suit up. You said what? Has tonight kind of been building like Nah. Nah. He was just next on the schedule. Lakers, actually, I won't even say him, Lakers. And then, you know, they beat us last time. I didn't get to play, like I said, last year. They came on our home floor, beat us on our home floor. It was laughing, playing, looking at me, talking. Um, you know, my message was I was in street clothes. Um, this was my first opportunity to get back on the floor playing against them. 
Um, I bring first, you know, whoever. Uh, then the situation happened, which pretty much got me going. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. I'm sitting there. I was, I was at his locker. I was recording. And I'm just sitting there like, oh, this is gold. This is awesome. And I think it is awesome. People are going to criticize Ja for not being humble and this, that, this, that. This sport has never been about humility. This sport has been always about, I got more game than you. I'm going to talk trash. I'm going to let you know it. I'm not saying John ja Morant is LeBron James. I am certainly saying John ja Morant has proven to be a good enough player that he should not back down from LeBron James. And, you know, listen, even I, we didn't play the clip, but we talked to Jaron Jackson Jr. in the locker room after that. And I asked Jaron, I said, you know, Josh said he doesn't like them. Do you view this as a rivalry? And Jaron said, yeah, whenever you lose to someone in the playoffs, his quote was, it's forever beef. So I like that. Yeah, they don't, they don't like them. They knocked them out of the playoffs a couple years ago. They clearly did not like LeBron and whoever else. You know, Josh said there were a bunch of them talking in that game. That was the final weekend of the regular season last year when the Grizzlies were playing. I mean, just guys you never heard of before. Um, just every night was a game of basketball immaculate grid of like, oh, who are you? Um, yeah. And, you know, the Lakers made the playoffs, and they needed to win that game for seeding and whatnot, so – Obviously, there was a moment where Ja and LeBron kind of come face to face, and Ja tells him, wait until I suit up. And, you know, I asked Ja, I said, you know, has that been building? And Ja said, nah, they were next on the schedule. But then Ja went on for like another 25 seconds about how it's definitely been building since that time last year because they were talking trash, and he couldn't do anything about it. So I think it's great. And I, <clears throat> I've seen a couple people point it out. I got no problem with players in the modern NBA being cool with each other for the most part, I kind of like a little rivalry. And I don't think it's personal between Ja and LeBron because Ja has given LeBron his flowers time and time again when the opportunity is called for it. But, yeah, I, I don't mind the competitive juices firing like that and saying, I don't like those guys and I've been waiting for this. And they popped it on our home floor last year. Well, I wasn't playing, so now I told them that. I, I love everything about it. And... Ja obviously has, you know, people, some people don't like Ja because of some of the off-court stuff that at a certain point, I think the shelf life on that needs to run out. We need to move on. But some people won't like it because they don't like Ja. But I, I loved all of it. I think, and it's, I don't think there's a player in the league that doesn't respect and revere LeBron James no, anyway. of course not. Yeah, they all do. I, and the great thing about the NBA is, like you said, with when you get a playoff series like that, especially when they go six, seven games, you really get intense rival rivalries because you're playing these same teams over and over again. And, and being in the West, they see each other every year a few times. Um, I don't know. It just makes, it's what makes the sport great. It's, I don't think there's a level of disrespect to it. It's like, it's like just trying to show, hey, no, I'm, I'm actually better than you because if you don't think you're better than everyone else, nobody else is going to believe it. So... I just think I think the Grizzlies are still in a point where they're trying to prove themselves. Yep. And Jaws really got to be that leader that drives that. And for him to go, no, we're we're better than you. We can beat you, and then run them off the floor anyway. Um, th that's what gets a team going, and that's that's kind of what that's kind of what you need to get through a whole season because you can get stagnant in the long 82 game season. You got to get some juice. Get you get yourself up for these games. And I love it. I, th I think that energy is exactly what they need. People forget, too, the last game of that playoff series a couple years ago, I mean, the Lakers embarrassed the Grizzlies yep. by 40 and set them home for the summer. And remember, Anthony Davis had the alley-oop dunk, uh, dunk over Jaron. Jaron went crash to the floor. And then early last season when Ja was suspended and Grizzlies were dealing with a bunch of injuries, Lakers destroyed them in L.A. again. Anthony Davis said after the game, he was on uh, the Lakers postgame show, and he was asked, basically, when's the last time you had a game that easy? And he said, oh, the last time we played these guys. So <laughs> uh, trash talk's gone back and forth. Obviously, Anthony mm -hmm. Davis didn't play in this game. But, yeah, you know, I, I think the Grizzlies would, would not mind a rematch against the Lakers in the playoffs. I'm sure, you know, the, the Warriors are off to a really good start this year. I'm sure they wouldn't mind seeing them again. Uh, and it must be said, too, 
that moment where Ja gets teed up and FedEx Forum comes to life, after that, the Grizzlies kind of put the game away. And everyone I talked to in the locker room said, yeah, that moment kind of, I don't know if galvanized them is the right word, but like the juice in the crowd helped carry them in the third quarter when they put the game out of reach, essentially. So, yeah, man, I, it was fun. Like that, and to be honest, for how monotonous at times regular season NBA games can get, <clears throat> to have that in a regular season game in the first week of November is awesome for the league. Yeah. Absolutely awesome. Yeah. I, I do think as well, one other thing I want to bring up on this before we talk about the Grizzlies tonight, just at large. As a Timberwolves fan, but you've seen how Anthony Edwards has become a media darling of, so, of sorts, even if Anthony Edwards ain't, ain't always the most humble guy in the world. I was curious, no, if this was Anthony no. Edwards saying that, I think the reaction would be a little different, no? I don't think there would have been any backlash, yes, honestly. Right. I mean, right. certain players have certain reputations. Obviously, Jaws' reputation, you know, is a work in progress, but yeah, a guy like Anthony Edwards. But but also the 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 NBA landscape at whole is going to try to draw up these rivalries anyway. We saw it last year with Anthony Edwards and Kyrie Irving. A little little sound bite turned into this whole thing of he's dis he's and, know, and, and, and Anthony Edwards and, and Kevin Durant, you know. who is his favorite player. He said. right, yeah, and I mean <clears throat> again you. The, the playoff energy in the NBA is just so great. And this kind of felt like a playoff game just because yep. of the crowd, the atmosphere, two teams that don't like each other. <coughs> and the trash talk goes both ways. Yeah. LeBron 100%. trash talks guys. It's, 100%. Everyone does it. it. He doesn't go and speak about it to the media afterwards all the time. But, um, you know, one of, one of like, the quietest, like, NBA stars in recent memory, like, the guy that – was never said anything to the media. Tim Duncan. Yeah. If you hear the stories about like, I think Lamarcus Aldridge has a really good story about when he was a rookie and Tim Duncan was just yeah. baiting him the whole game, yep. just calling him trash. Like, guys do that. It, everyone you, does it. it. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, and then you've got guys like Kevin Garnett, who Stephen Adams told the story about. Well, first time he faced him, he was like, "No English, bro." <laughs> Which is hilarious. So, yeah, I think it was well, awesome. Garnett could get him. Get him. <coughs> Garnett could talk some trash for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, what else do we want to talk, Riz? Hopefully they don't play the Nets in the NBA Finals. I've got, uh, <laughs> I, I can't imagine that. I've got the upcoming schedule here. For yeah, them. please do. Take a gander at it. So we got Washington tonight. Uh, then they travel to Portland. Um, and then we get right back into the Lakers on their floor. We get two rivalries in three nights. Yeah, and then Golden State and Denver. So we're not looking at an easy stretch of the uh, of the schedule. Um, you know, you you want to get Washington and Portland out of the way, <coughs> yeah. handle your business there before you get a, a pretty tough three game stretch. Yeah, John not playing tonight. He left that game. He took a hard fall on an alley oop attempt that wasn't called a foul somehow. Uh, they called it right hamstring. They call it a right hamstring injury during the game, and then the injury report came out yesterday. It is apparently right hip soreness, which I think you'd rather have hip soreness than a hamstring injury. So he will not play tonight. I would imagine with the Trailblazers up next, with all due respect to the Portland Trailblazers, I would not be surprised not if he didn't play in that game either, if the Grizzlies tried to pick up two wins without him against two, <clears throat> let's call it what it is, two of the worst teams in the league. Uh, Interestingly they, enough, uh, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt you. The, the Wizards have two wins on the seasons, and they both came against the Hawks. Interesting. So, so they're, Wizards they're two Hawks, and four. A Wizards Hawks Easter Conference Finals will uh, be skewed heavily <laughs> towards the Wizards. Uh, Portland is three and six on the year. And Portland's they, weird. They I kind of like. I, I like some of Portland's young players, but I do. I don't think they're really. <laughs> but they're close not to, to being this competitive yeah. at this point. But yeah. But, yeah, that Lakers rematch next Wednesday is going to be awesome. That I think that I believe that might be an ESPN game. i got to double-check on that. It should be. Uh, I know it's a 9 o'clock start. 9 it's, o'clock Central start from L.A. And the Lakers are on ESPN about every other night. So, uh, so yeah, looking forward to that. All right, let's talk team that shares the building with the Grizzlies, the Memphis Tigers starting, basketball team starting their season with a win over Mizzou. Now, if we want to roll this tape real quick. Um, First half was really ugly and kind of worrisome, to be honest, because they had zero flow offensively, although this was the first basket of the season. Admittedly, 
pretty sick first basket of the season, <laughs> alley to Nick Jordé. But then Mizzou kind of got a lot of what they wanted offensively. Memphis was turning the ball over a ton. Down 10 at halftime. And it looks, all right, like, what are we getting into here? But I think the second half was awesome. They started hitting their shots, but more importantly, they were getting after it defensively. They were forcing turnovers, and that allowed them to get easy looks at the open floor, like this right here from Tyrese Hunter. And I think we found out pretty quickly, too, that P.J. Haggerty, who was the AC freshman of the year last year at Tulsa, he looked every bit like the go-to guy you could count on late in games. And he scored 25 in this game, which led all scores, but it was this. I mean, he was just getting to the rim at will, got to the free throw line a ton. So Memphis starts the season with a nine-point win over Mizzou. Uh, let's hear from Penny Hardaway just on kind of the identity that he's looking for and got in the second half. Yeah, it's definitely what I was talking about when we went out in the um, – after the season was over, the way that it ended, to go out and try to get toughness and defense. Guys that we knew that we could put in positions to win ball games on the defensive end and not worry about if the ball goes in or not. And that's just – that's who we want to be. And uh, I'm getting back to my identity. All right, so now – and I, I agree with what a lot of Penny said. You know, last season's team was certainly, I think, more talented, and he's admitted that. But this year's team – uh, if they can play the way they did the second half every night, which is going to require a lot of energy, and he didn't play that many guys. They also did lose Tyreek Smith to the transfer portal five hours before the season started. So that was someone that was going to play a good amount of minutes. So they're a little bit thin right now by the looks of it, but they do have open spots, and they can get someone in the portal. We saw that last year when they added Naquan Tomlin. I imagine Petty's going to go hunting again this year. But, yeah, I think the second half was really encouraging just because – I didn't see. There were very few spurts last year where the Memphis uh, basketball team played defense at that level. So, that was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, they yeah. go to UNLV. I've got the uh, schedule for you got the schedule for this, too. Well. Let's do it. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah. UNLV. Yep. We got <coughs> Ohio, yep, San Francisco, here. UConn, and Now, Arkansas UConn is part State. of the Maui Classic. So, there, there are probably going to be more games mixed in there. But, right. man, that's going to be a good test. Kind of got a couple of... Now, UNLV beat Alabama State, who is uh, – they're coached by Memphis native Tony Madlock. Uh, they beat them earlier in the week, 93-79 at home. So, Tigers go to there tomorrow. It's a 5 o'clock tip. Looking forward to that. But, yeah, Maui's going to be the first real barometer, I think, of where this team is uh, and how they're coming together. Because Mizzou is an SEC team. They also went 0-18 in SEC play last year. So, TBD on how good they are. But, yeah, good. It's nice to start the season with a win because if – the first half would have carried over the entire way. The offense looked that bad. Then it's going to get kind of noisy kind of quick. But you win. You do everything you need defensively. Cool. Good start for Memphis. All right. NFL Week 10. Uh, we, talking, we talking trades? Because there were some trades. <laughs> the deadline was on Tuesday. It wasn't yeah. anything crazy. Well, it's interesting because I think the main thing this year was just kind of Swapping wide receivers for picks, yeah, was was seemed to be kind of the theme. It was interesting to see the value that certain guys got over another. <coughs> I know like the Cowboys are getting pretty clown for Jonathan trading a Mingo. fourth for Jonathan Mingo, who's Almost really so not been good. Yeah, he is not. Um, but yeah, I mean, the biggest move on know. Tuesday was the Saints trading Marshawn Lattimore to the Commanders. I like that move. For Washington. I love that move. Seven to two. Their secondary has been kind of buns for a while. So to get a proven guy who's played the position at a high level, you gave him a third round pick, so you gave up something of value. But if they could go on a run in what is frankly outside of the Detroit Lions, I think the NFC is pretty wide open this year. So if they could put themselves in a position to go on a run, I'm all for that for sure. They've definitely looked good enough that you got to respect their odds of winning the East at this point. Yeah. I know Philadelphia has been kind of up and down, but they've looked They're a little bit better well right recently. Now. Yeah. Um, In spite of Nick Sirianni, it must be said. <laughs> but, yeah, I like I like what Washington's doing. I like I like the uh, Jaden Daniels-Terry McLaurin connection. So. Yeah. Jaden Daniels has been awesome. And, really, if you think about it, they're 7-1 since week one. They, they lost to the Buccaneers pretty handily week one, and their only loss since then. It's to the Baltimore Ravens. Speaking of the Baltimore Ravens, they won to start out Week 10 last night. Man, first half of that game was, it was okay. It wasn't anything special. Second half of that game, man, Lamar and Joe Burrow put on a show. Ravens win 35-34. 
Bengals, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Bengals score what could have been the game time touchdown in the final minute. They go for two, which I like that move because that defense was not stopping the Ravens offense for yeah, anything. Uh, yeah, I think that's the right call. I mean, <laughs> what the is Bengals it? are kind of in a, in a little bit of a desperate spot <coughs> because they're, they're four and six now. Uh, they re- that's a game they really needed to win. Yeah. They're pretty much probably out of the running for that division at this point. They're going to be hoping for a wild card. Yeah. So, you know, ch- trying to steal a win from the Ravens on the road, I, I-, I like that. <laughs> I like Listen to some of these stat lines. Joe Burrow last night, 428 passing yards, four touchdowns, no picks, 34 of 56 throwing the ball. I think he threw the ball 29 times in the first half. Uh, Jamar Chase. Whew. Unreal. God, God bless if you face him in fantasy this week. Good for you if you have him in fantasy. 11 catches, 264 yards, three touchdowns. Fun fact, none of those are career highs for him in a game. That's crazy. That's crazy. I, think, I don't know what you think. I think Jamar Chase at this point has firmly entrenched himself as the second-best wide receiver in the NFL. Behind his college teammate, Justin Jefferson, who is absurd to think about the fact that those two were on the same team in college five years ago. Yeah, I yeah I would agree. I would put Chase number two as well. Um, yeah, he, he's <laughs> that LSU 2019 team was just All time <laughs> outrageous. And then Lamar um, last night, 25 to 33, 290 yards passing, 33 running. I think he's a little banged up. He didn't take off quite as much as he usually does. Although he almost had the run of the year from a quarterback at least. You know, I think he traveled 58 yards total. Just looped around, got to the edge from pass rushers. I'm sitting there, I'm like, throw it away, throw it away. And the next you go, it's like, oh, my God, he might score a touchdown in this play. <laughs> got stopped at the one, which set up a Derrick Henry touchdown. But, yeah, man, tough for the Bengals because that was a game where it was everything was going their way until Chase Brown fumbled in the third quarter, and then the Ravens captured that momentum and never gave it back. Uh, they moved to 7-3. to three. I said, man, I talking with a couple of friends last night. If he stays healthy, I think Lamar Jackson is probably going to win his third MVP this year before he He's turns gotta be the favorite right now. 28 years old. Yeah. At that point, I understand in terms of putting yourself in position with the all-time greats, there has to be more playoff success in the conversation. I'll tell you right now, if Lamar Jackson wins his third MVP before he turns 28 years old, he can retire after the season, and he is moonwalking to the Hall of Fame. He's probably in the Hall of Fame already right now. I think right he now. is already. Yeah. yeah. But you win three before 28, nah, there's no question. I saw, I saw an interesting comparison the other, uh, maybe last night. Um, somebody said, like, the, Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes are the modern Peyton Manning and Tom Brady. As far as, like, career yeah. arcs, Lamar's I, I, had a lot. Lamar's winning the MVPs. He's not a lot of <coughs> success. And Mahomes just wins everything. I think that it's interesting to think about how we compare what I think are the other big three quarterbacks in the AFC to Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, and Joe Burrow. Um, And really, because Burrow, I think, probably is, and this is no disrespect, I think he's the worst of the four of them, which is, I mean, again, Burrow's an Uh, elite, elite quarterback, but he's probably the worst of the four of them. But he's also the one that's had the most head-to-head success yep. against Mahomes. And then Lamar is you – know, keep in mind, if Lamar wins MVP this year, he has more regular season MVPs than Mahomes. He just has three less right. Super Bowl wins and Super Bowl MVPs. <laughs> uh, Pat's got all – Pat's got everything. I mean, Pat is on like a go trajectory. And then Al is a guy that just can't – I don't think it's necessarily fall of his own, but Al is a guy that – looks like he should be the one most poised to knock Mahomes off the throne on any given year, but it just hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I th- I think <laughs> I-, I think the Ravens are the biggest threat this year. Yes, I, I, I just don't know that Buffalo has the talent around Allen right now. Maybe uh, Amari a- a- Cooper apparently has a broken bone in one of his hands that he's going to play through, but I oof. think that was a nice move. I, I think That's it is. Tough. I think we are, as things stand right now, I think that we are primed for another – AFC Championship game rematch between the Chiefs and the Ravens. It's just a matter of, at some point, Lamar's got to do it. Like at, at some point, I think that he is too good to not get over the hump one of these years. Must be said, there are two things that can be true. Actually, three things. 
I don't think Lamar has ever played better than he has right now this season. I think this is the best group of weapons Lamar has had around him. Derrick Henry, Zay Flowers in year two. Rashad Bateman is finally healthy. He's played well. Trade for Deontay Johnson. Mark Andrews is not a left tackle anymore like he was for the first month of the season. <laughs> uh, so the offense is sick. I think this is also the worst Ravens defense I can remember in a long time. Yeah. Like, their secondary is really, really bad. At case in point, what Jamar Chase did to them last night. Um, now, is Lamar Jackson, the offense, good enough to overcome that in the playoffs? I think probably. <laughs> but this is not <laughs> – people think of the Ravens defense one of the best in the year uh, – Best of the league year in a year out. They are not that right now. Ray Lewis ain't walking through that door. No, neither is do, T Sizzle. Do, if if they pl- if the AFC Championship game was tomorrow between the two, you think the Ravens would do it this year? You think this would be the year that they take them? Granted, the Chiefs are undefeated, and it's, it still he, feels he, like we haven't the, seen the best of them. Here's the thing. Last year, I think they could have done it, but they came up with one of the dumbest game plans in an AFC champion or a conference yeah. championship game you could ever think of because. The Chiefs last year were very weak against the run. What do the Ravens do in the AFC Championship game? They come out and they have Lamar Jackson throwing the ball over the field, which clearly he could do. But it, I've said it since that game. That almost felt like a game where Lamar and Todd Munkin and the offensive general, it was like they were trying to prove the narratives wrong. <laughs> it was like they were trying to prove that Lamar could beat Patrick Mahomes straight up in a game of that magnitude where Lamar is just sitting back and slaying it the entire way. So... Thankfully, this year, you have no excuse to not feed Derrick Henry in a game like that. So, yeah. I narratives think, don't matter when no. you're. <laughs> no, you, <laughs> when know, you, you know what matters? Win. And you know what, you know what dispels all narratives? Winning Super Bowls. Yeah. So, but yes, I think that right now, gun to my head, I would say my Super Bowl pick would probably be Lions versus Ravens. But I will never discount Patrick Mahomes anytime, yeah. but especially not in January. So, but I think those are the two favorites in the AFC right now. Um, Quick gander at the schedule, and then we'll get into trivia for good games this week. 49ers Buccaneers could be a little interesting. And man, Buccaneers came really close to knocking off the Chiefs the other night. Steelers Commanders, I mean, <clears throat> not sure a lot of people would have picked that at the start of the season, but that all of a sudden becomes a pretty intriguing game. I don't know if Eagles Cowboys is that much fun, really, especially with Cooper Rush playing quarterback. By the way, all the Cowboys fans, <laughs> no. I know it's going to happen. Cooper Rush is not better than Dak Prescott. I know you guys love to no. play about Dak. <laughs> Do not go down this road at any point over the next however many weeks because it sounds like Dak's going to be out for a while. They said that man's hamstring is off the bone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, their season is probably They're toast cooked. at this point. It was probably toast even if he wasn't hurt. But Sunday Night Football right here on Action 5 is going to be a lot of fun. Lions versus Texans. Oh. TBD if Nico Collins plays for Houston. I sure is... hope he plays. Yeah, I hope he does too. Um Houston's looked really kind of lost without him as well, especially with Diggs out now, too. Their offensive line. CJ has not looked good. Their offensive line is really bad. Their offensive line is problematically bad. They are 4 0 at home this year, so we'll see. They also just lost. They have had kind of the mini bye because they lost to my my Jets last Thursday night. (coughs) But. Yeah, uh, the Lions did add. uh, Lions made a deadline move, too. They added Packer Legend Zedaria Smith. He's not going to replace Aiden Hutchinson. You can't do that, but certainly bolster them a little bit. So, yeah, I look forward to that game. Um, if, if Houston gets Nico Collins back, that's going to be a big, big boost because, hey, I said it at the start of the year, and we'll see if it comes to fruition or not with uh, how many games he has left. But I said I thought he was a top-10 receiver in the league, and certainly he was playing like it before he got hurt. I, I, he was the best wide receiver in the league before he got hurt. Yeah. He was – he was on the trajectory he was on yeah. was insane. Yeah, he's sick uh, I, I, I would even go as far as to say he's probably a top five receiver. Ever. <coughs> you know, I had this thought the other day because I think if you told me good to my head, rank top five, I think I would probably say Jefferson Chase. I still think I'm putting CeeDee Lamb up there. Um, blank down on one. Uh, Jefferson Chase. Who am I blanking out on? Um, like, would you put. Tyreek in there still, I'm not sure. That's probably an interesting enough question. Mm. Um, why am I blanking out? I said Lamb. But yeah, I, I think... St. Brown? I think Amon Ra's a little too slot heavy. for He's a good player, though. Really good player. Um, you know, I think it came down to it. I forgot. I think I might have said Tyreek. 
And then, um, like, five for me came down to, like, A.J. Brown and Nico Collins. Oh, yeah. A.J. Brown's been A.J. Brown's been sick. <laughs> A.J. Brown, A.J. Brown, when he's been on the field this year, has been, has been awesome. So, yeah, that is Sunday Night Football. And then Monday Night Football is Dolphins versus Rams in L.A. So, that could be a low-key, pretty fun, high-scoring game as well. Assuming the Dolphins' offense can get back to where they should be. Yeah. That is that game is what that game is tied for the highest hole this weekend with 40 Irish Buccaneers. So they're expecting some fireworks. Both of those make sense. All right, man. Let's let's finish this off with some trivia. I think I've done pretty well fighting through fighting through my flu game. It's not a flu game. I just got a cold, <laughs> but as I'm sure you can tell I'm not feeling perfectly well. But all right, let's get some trivia going. All right, so I loaded up a little little quick on time today. So loaded up a sporkle. I think that we can clear. Okay. It is name. Every player with 130 <clears throat> or more RBIs in a season since 2000. Okay, I think I could definitely get down I think, with this. I think we'll be able to clear this. Can, so can, we, get, can we get this up on the screen I'll for the people uh, as well? Yeah. I'll, uh, so, if you can't read the screen, it's got the years and the teams next to it as well. So, I'll let you uh, hit start and uh, we can oh, list that, off some names starting? whenever you're ready. Am I, am I typing too, or are you? Is it me? Uh, yeah, you type. All right, let's go. I'll, I'll let you handle it. All right, 2001 Cubs, that would be one Sammy Sosa. That is two of yeah, them. 2007 exactly. Yankees, that would be one Alex Rodriguez. Rodriguez. He's on there. <clears> 2004 times. Orioles, I believe, will be Miguel Tejada. It is. 2006 oh. Phillies will be Ryan, Ryan Howard. Howard. 2005 Red Sox, we could go Big Poppy. I think Manny Ramirez will probably be on here too. Uh, but we'll go down the list in order. Uh, is that Larry Rockies. Walker? <clears throat> 2000 Rockies? That's Todd Helton. Oh, Helton. It is Todd Helton. Go Vols. Uh, <laughs> 2003 Blue Jays will be Carlos Delgado. Delgado. Mariners. 2000 uh, would be Griffey, right? I think it would be Griffey. Or Edgar. No. Is it Edgar? It is Edgar Martinez. The 2024 Yankees will be one Aaron Judge. He's on there twice. 144 is crazy. 05 Red Sox will be one Manny Ramirez. Yep. 2000 Royals is good. Is that Beltron? Oh. <clears throat> Mike Sweeney. Sweet. Oh, good pull. Mike Sweeney. 05 Rangers. Is uh, that going to be Canarco? I don't know if Canerco ever had 144. Rangers, though. Not, not White Sox. Oh, oh. I, I, White Sox I was leave. looking. Okay. I was um, looking at the next it's one. It's not A-Rod. Um, would it be Alfonso Soriano? So, it's got to be Soriano. No. Right? No? Palmero was off the <laughs> team that year. Um, it's not Teixeira, is it? Would that be too ooh, early that for could him? be. Yeah, ooh, great call. Okay. 2000 White Sox, I believe it's Frank that's, Thomas. Yeah, that's not going to be Canerco. 01 Diamondbacks, Luis Gonzalez. One of 57 home Insane runs that year. Insane season. Yep. Uh, 01 Mariners, would that be Brett Boone? It would be. Man, we got 01 a free, Mariners, so good. We got a free Juan Gonzalez for that yep, we did. Uh, answer as well. 09 Brewers, I believe, will be Prince. It is. I yep. uh, wouldn't be surprised if Ryan Braun's on here at some point. 03 Rockies. That's got to be Walker, right? No, nah, we already put Walker in. Uh, oh, yeah. Wow. Whoa. Who? A third hitter. Wow. Uh, no, nah, he was gone by then. Uh, Vinny. Castillo. Oh, it's got to be, right? Uh, he was in there. Oh, he, he was 04 Rockies. 04 Rockies. Wow, okay. 03 Rockies. All right, wow. we'll come back to that one. Uh, 12 Tigers, I believe, Cabrera. will be Miggy. Yep, we got a couple of Miggies. 2023 Braves will be Ronald. Or will it be Matt Olson? Oh, that's Olson, yeah. Yep. Uh, 07 Tigers would be a Maglio or Donez. How about it? Boom. 02 White Sox as well. Uh, 2013 Orioles will be Chris Davis. Yep. 01 Giants, and we know it's Barry. 2000 A's will be Jason Giambi. 07 Rockies, that's got to be Matt Holiday. Yes. 06 Cardinals, we're going to go Albert. Albert. Goat, on there three times. 06 Astros, we're going Berkman. Yep. 2016 Rockies. Whoa. Is that Nolan? Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be. Yep. Wow, those three, like three times. times. He did it three years in a row. Uh, 2000, 2000 Astros. Astros. Je Jeff Bagwell? Yep. Yep. Oh, there a couple Twice. times. 2003 oh, Braves. Sorry. Hey, Javi Lopez. No? No. I mean, he had a monster chipper? Year. Yeah, I'm going to go Chipper now. No. No. Oh, Andrew Jones. No? No. Gary Sheffield? Yes. Wow. Okay. 2017 Marlowe. It's got to be John Carlo. Uh, obviously. 22 Mets would be, would that be Alonzo? Pete? Alonzo? Yep. 
Oh, three, oh, three. fills. Bobby Abreu? Pat Burrell. Pat Burrell. No. Wow, no. <clears throat> um, no Pat. Hmm. Wouldn't be Utley, right? No, I think he was, I mean, if we put it in, but I think Utley came after that. Wow, interesting. Okay, let's let's circle back to that. Uh, 08 Rangers will be Josh Hamilton. Uh, 06 Twins will be Justin Morneau. Yep. 18 Red Sox, would that be Mookie Betts? No. Devers? 08 Red Sox won the World uh, 18. 18 Red Sox won the World Series. Uh, Was that J.D. Martinez? I, that might be a great call. It is. Phenomenal call. 24 Dodgers. Uh, it's got to show it, right? Yep. Down to two, a player on the 03 Rockies and the 03 <laughs> Phillies. Both same year is interesting. Andres Colorado wasn't sold the Rockies, was he? I think 1G in his name, but. Yeah. I might be spelling his name. Let me see if I can spell his name right. I'm kind of lost on both of these. No, it's not Galarraga. Yeah, <coughs> it's not Bobby Abreu. It's not Pat Burrell for the 03 Phillies. Um, man, this is tough. Roland was on the Cardinals. Roland got traded to the right? Cardinals in 02. I remember that very clearly, so it wasn't him. Uh, okay, we got to get out of here, so I'm going <laughs> to pull the plug. 50 AS 60 is pretty good. Get the sponsored content out of here, although I know you we'll, gotta pay the bills. We'll wait on the sponsored content real quick. I am really I, curious who this is. I think the Phillies is bothering me. Because the thing is, we got the 04 Rockies in Vinny Castilla. Yeah. But apparently that was not the 03 Rockies. <coughs> hey, 58, 58 out of 60 is an A plus though. I did Preston we Wilson and Jim Tobey. Okay, Jim Tobey, we probably should go. Ah, Preston Wilson is a wild Preston one. Preston Wilson is crazy. Preston how Wilson many, is nuts. How many did he have? 141. 141. What a season. Because I think it hit Shout with the Shout out Marlins. Preston Wilson. Jim Tobey is wild. Uh, Jim Tobey, we should go. Preston Wilson is nuts, though. <laughs> That's a crazy I was answer. never getting that one. Okay. All right. Uh, our cue to wrap up has come. Uh for Jacob Gallant, I'm Matt Enfield. Thank you so much for watching us. Remember, Friday Football Fever coming up tonight at 10 on Action News 5. We will have a ton of sports content for you for a busy weekend on the grid.